in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be talking about the symbolism of baptism. And we're going to talk a little bit about baptism and, and um, what the, the symbolism that's involved in that. And, and 1 Peter chapter 3 and... Um, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse... Let's start in verse 18. Uh, we're down through 22. 1 Peter three eighteen through 22. Peter says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism, doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto Him. Amen. So um, I like that last part there. Angels, authorities and powers are made subject unto Christ. You know, He has been uh, raised up from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of God. He, he sat down and his, the Bible says He's been given a name which is above every name. And, and uh, angels, authorities and powers are, are made subject unto Him. So, one day, the Bible says we're going to see Him. We're going to appear before Him. He's going to judge the living and the dead. And so, you know, we need to have our hearts focused on purifying ourselves by faith. But uh, this morning, I want to talk about uh, baptism as a figure. He says the like figure. Like meaning it's like Noah's flood. Because he says in verse 20 here that um, Noah... Uh, in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, he says, wherein few that is eight souls are saved by water, the like figure whereunto even baptism. So what he's connecting here is that the flood of Noah is a figure. I mean, it was a real historical event. It, you know, it, it really happened. But it was the reason God chose that judgment, he could have chosen any number of judgments. You know, if the Lord wanted, he could have sent some plague and wiped out the whole earth. But he chose the flood. He chose that particular judgment because it was a figure, uh, and it's the same figure that water baptism is a figure of. And that is God's judgment, God's wrath being poured out. And so when we're looking at this, I want you to see that, you know, he says uh, baptism doth also now save us. And, and a lot of people get confused and they think that water baptism gives you regeneration, like it regenerates you, which it does not. You know, Paul said that. Uh, he told the Corinthians, he said, you have not, uh, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. And then he said in chapter 1, he said, I, I thank God I baptized none of you, <laughs> or except for a few. But he said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And so you're not regenerated by water baptism. As a matter of fact, you, you are to be regenerated before water baptism. As we see the, you know, the Ethiopian eunuch, in, in Acts chapter 8, when uh, Philip was uh, preaching the gospel to him, and he said, well, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And he said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then he baptized. Well, John said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, or, or Paul said that uh, Jesus is the Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, Right? And, and John, First John uh, chapter 4, he said that uh, if you confess that uh, Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in you. And so the regeneration, which is where the life of God comes into you, that's when you're born again. That comes by the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you hear about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Jesus Christ of Scripture, and that uh, you know he he died for your sins and he rose again from the dead and you receive that and you accept that by faith you're regenerated that God gives you newness of life and God dwells in you and so that is the prerequisite for water baptism and water baptism is a commandment I mean it's not a peripheral thing it's you know it's not insignificant Jesus said to go into all the world and teach all nations. 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. So if you've not been water baptized, it's not to uh, you know, downplay the significance of it. It is significant. It's important. But he says that it doesn't save us in the, in the sense of putting away the filth of the flesh. And uh, you know, some people think that's just talking about like a bath. You, know? you just clean the dirt off your body. But I don't think he's uh, talking about that here. I think uh, you know, when, you, when you look in uh, Colossians chapter 2, Paul says that um, we are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, wherein you are risen with Him through faith in the operation of God, who hath raised Him from the dead. And so he's associating the, the body of the sins of the flesh with putting off the filth of the flesh is the old man. Because when Jesus was crucified, we were crucified with him. When he died on the cross, he died as us. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, he said, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so... When we uh, understand what uh, what baptism is a figure of, it's a figure of the death of Christ and it's associating our death with His death and our resurrection with His resurrection. You know, and so, you know, we don't rise from the dead on our own willpower, right? We don't decide, I'm going to rise from the dead, you know, and, and we don't decide, I'm going to be regenerated. God is the... The Bible says, as many as received Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God which were born not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. You know, they were born of God. And so God is the one that gives life. And so Paul said he, he was a father to the Corinthians, and yet he didn't baptize them. So I just want you to see that the salvation that he's talking about here, the word salvation doesn't always mean regeneration in the Bible. You know, Paul said now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. And he was talking about the salvation of our bodies, the re the, when the Lord returns and we're caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, these corruptible bodies put on incorruption, these mortal bodies put on immortality. That's the salvation that we're waiting for. That's the salvation of our bodies. And Paul is saying here that the salvation that he's referring to with regards to baptism is not putting off the old man, not crucifying the flesh with his affections and lusts. That's not what, you know, that's not what it does. Actually, um, some people teach this. I had a, a uh, man that I was uh, used to go into the jail ministry with. He was a Church of Christ uh, um, member, I guess. I don't think he was a uh, preacher or anything. But he, they believe that you have to be water baptized to be regenerated. And uh, one day he was telling me that to deny yourself and to take up your cross, that Jesus was talking about water baptism. And <laughs> I said, well, I guess he's not read uh, you know, Luke chapter 9 because... And I actually asked him about that because Jesus said, if a man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So, I mean, we don't have to get water baptized daily, right? <laughs> so it's, it's easy to confuse these categories sometimes when you're, uh, you know, when you're, you're going through the scriptures. And we've got to pray and ask for the Lord to help us not to, not to make errors in, in our, in our uh, understanding. But the, the uh, salvation here is a reference to having an answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And having an, uh, a good conscience is something that we all should strive for. You know, this should be part of our uh, spiritual life. If you want to have a sincerity of faith, then you need to have and be striving for a good conscience. You know, Paul said in, in uh, Acts chapter 24, he said that... Um, that he exercises, he said, I exercise myself to have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. So that should be our goal, is always to have our hearts clear before God, to have a conscience that is clear before God. If our heart condemn us, the Bible says God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. And so we, if we confess our sins, right, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. And, and so... Christ's uh, blood is sprinkled, sprinkles us to, to the purification of our conscience. Meaning, if I confess my sins and I have my faith in the blood of Christ, I, I know my sins are forgiven. You know, it's not because of an experience, it's because of the Word of God. The Word of God said that Christ shed His blood for my sins. If I confess my sins, I don't have to prove to somebody that I've, 
you know, that I've confessed my sins. I just have to have a conscience that's right before God. And your conscience is right before God when your faith is in the blood of Christ. And it doesn't matter what your sins are. The Bible says that, that Christ loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. And so if you sin, you know, when we take the Lord's Supper, He tells us to examine ourselves and, and so we don't take the, the, the uh, cup of the Lord unworthily. But He said, let Him examine Himself. Um, you can take the Lord's Supper as long as you confess all your sins. You know, you're right with God. You, you, you're, you've confessed. You've, you've forsaken them. And if your faith is in the blood of Christ, you shouldn't have any more conscience of that sin, any more guilt or condemnation for that sin. Amen. You know, if you've repented and you have confessed it and your faith is in the blood of Christ, then that sin is gone as far as the east is from the west, right? God has removed that transgression from us. And amen. Praise the Lord because there's no other salvation. There's no way to get out from under the judgments of God. There's no way to, to soothe, to, to actually alleviate our conscience apart from the blood of Christ. And in place of that, unfortunately, people harden their hearts and they defile their conscience. And the Bible talks about those whose consciences are seared with a hot iron. They don't feel shame or guilt over anything. And so there are people like that that are, that are out there that you're going to encounter. But as Christians, we should be striving to have and exercising ourselves to have a good conscience. A conscience that is not only a void of offense to God, but also that's void of, of offense to one another. You know, if we sin against one another, then we should confess to one another, right? We should go to our brother privately or sister privately and, and say, hey, I'm sorry for that. You know, hopefully your conscience when you're in prayer with God, if you sinned and you may have forgotten about it, the, the Holy Ghost will bring it to your remembrance, right? And so the Lord will convict us. And so we can, we can be forgiven for that, but what we also need to strive to, to have a conscience void of offense to one another. Right? That's how we can maintain unity between one another is to have our consciences cleared to one another. Not consciences seared, but consciences cleared. And that should be our goal. And that comes again through the blood of Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ. Um, but So I wanted to get that first part out of the way because the, the main focus I want to uh, point to is what the, uh, what the cross, uh, what, what's going on between the cross and um, and, and water baptism. What, what's the symbolism here? And in Romans chapter 6, uh, we know this passage very well, but I want you to see here that Romans 6, Paul says in, uh, we'll just start in verse 1. He says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we? It's not, it's not, a question of, uh, you know, if you're walking in the grace of God, you're not going to sin. Christ is not the minister of sin. And so how can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death. So there's a baptism of death that the water baptism is a figure of. And the flood of Noah is a figure of. Remember, First Peter said that the like figure, meaning the flood was one figure, baptism is a like figure. And they're both figures, uh, they're both shadows or patterns of the cross where Jesus Christ was baptized into death and He endured God's wrath, we're going to see. The judgment of God. That's what happened in Noah's day. God wasn't cleansing in the sense of washing uh, uh, them to make them clean. He was destroying them. He was wiping them off the face of the earth. And in uh, uh, Genesis 6, I'll just read you just a, a one verse there regarding the flood. God said, Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. And so God's intention with the flood was judgment. It was destroying the wicked. They had, the, the earth had become so vile and so corrupt. And we look at our culture and we say, how much worse could it have been you know, in Noah's day that God said, that's it, I've had enough, I'm going to wipe it out. You know, and so he saved Noah and eight souls that said were saved by water. Well, they were saved from the corruption and the pollution that was in the world. And the way they were saved from it is because the wrath of God wiped it out. 
And they, in a, as, a, as a symbol of resurrection, were on the ark. They survived. They came through. And so along with the, the death of Christ, we have the resurrection of Christ. They're not separate. But Paul says in uh, Galatians chapter 6, and verse 14, he says, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. And so here's what the cross shows us, is that the world has been crucified. The world has been destroyed. The world has been judged. And it is, and I've been separated from the world. I've been called out of the world, but I also have been crucified on the cross. My old man has been destroyed. My sin has been judged on the cross. What Jesus did on the cross took care of not just my past sins, but it took care of that old man, the presence of sin that's in me now. And he nailed that to the cross. And so death uh, you know, doesn't have any dominion over Christ and sin shouldn't have any dominion over us because we've been risen again to walk in newness of life. We've got the life of God within us. But I want you to see that the world was crucified unto me. I was crucified unto the world. And this is a, a figure that you see in the flood of Noah. Now, I, I want to give you a couple verses here. Uh, we're, we're in Romans 6 and we were reading about... Uh, being baptized into death, and that death is a reference to or, or you know, symbolized by the floods, by the judgment of God. And Romans chapter 10, we see the same connection here in uh, verse 6 and 7. Paul says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. And the deep is a reference to the sea. If you go back and read Deuteronomy where he's quoted from, it's a reference to judgment. Bring up Christ again from the dead is bringing him up from the sea, if you will, the wrath of God, that judgment that was upon him. And so Christ, again, endured the wrath of God for our sins on the cross. And uh, I'll give you a couple of scriptures more uh, to support that. I mean, Noah's flood ought to be evidence enough, but um, there's a couple of verses I'll, I'll show you. In, uh, one's in Hosea, Hosea chapter 5, verse 10. God says that the princes of Judah were like them that removed the bound. Therefore, I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. And so God says, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to pour my wrath out upon them like water. But this is what God points to as illustration of His wrath, this, this uh, flood, these waves. And we see this figure uh, in lots of places in the Bible. And I'll show you another one here in uh, Psalm chapter 88. Psalm 88 and verse 6 and 7. And a lot of these are, are prophecies regarding Christ anyway. You see Christ in here. And, and I could, if we have a second, I'll show you in Psalm 69 that this is a, a prophecy of Christ. Um, but there are there's when you read the Psalms, there are multiple layers of prophecy that are built in here. There are some referencing you know David or, or the psalmist that was going through something at that time, but they were because they're prophetic, they point to Christ, but they also can point to uh, Israel, who's going to go uh, you know endure the judgment of God in the in the last days. But verse six in Psalm eighty eight, he says, "Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit in darkness, in the deeps." So here we have the, the figure of water. And he says, Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. So again, the judgment of God poured out in waves. And he said he would, his, his wrath was, was lying hard upon them. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, in verse 16, he says again, Thy fierce wrath goeth over me, thy terrors have cut me off. They came round about me daily like water, and they compassed me about together. And so we see again the figure made like that. And um, well, I'll give you Psalm 69 real quick. Psalm 69, if you read through this whole psalm, you can see allusions to Christ all through here. Not, they're not all allusions to Christ, but you know, he says, uh, you know, in Christ, when he was in the garden, the Bible said that he had offered up uh, prayer and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and that he feared. And his sweat became, as it were, great drops of blood. So when Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross, he wasn't, 
he wasn't fearing what man could do to him. He wasn't fearing that you know Romans were going to crucify him. He was fearing God. He was fearing the judgment of God. And when he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He was referring to the cup of the wrath of God. He was getting ready to endure the baptism of death. He was going to suffer the wrath that was going to come upon him on the cross for our sins. Because God is just. That's why hell is, is real, because God is just. And Christ endured this wrath for us to redeem us from our sins. And Psalm 69, he says, Save me, verse 1, O God, from the waters that are come in unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I'm coming to deep waters where the floods overflow me. And uh, I'll just skip through here, but you can see some of these are clearly referenced to Christ in the New Testament. He says, They hated they that hated me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. That was referenced in John, John's Gospel. And he said, uh, um, I have borne that reproach. Um, and I become a stranger unto my brethren and alien to my mother's children. That was also quoted. And the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. That was quoted in John. And the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. So we see this is, this is a Christ-centered prophetic psalm. And in the context here, he's talking about being cut off and enduring this suffering that, that he was going to suffer. And he made reference to being in deep waters. And he says, let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. And so this is what he was uh, praying. And then he, he went on, that, you know, that they gave me gall for my meat, and then my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink, which is again a, a prophecy of, of Christ. And so we see Christ in this, suffering the wrath of God, and, and referencing it as deep waters, being, being uh, uh, overflowed, with this wrath. His wrath lieth hard upon Christ. And I'm going to give you another uh, reference here in Jonah. And this is one that, you know, Jesus said as the sign of Jonah the prophet, you know, he's three days and three nights in the, in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And uh, if, you go, if you look at the book of Jonah and you see the symbolism here, it, it goes... Uh, um, it goes a little bit further in the symbolism. It's like, why did God choose these things? You know, why did God choose to flood uh, uh, the world with Noah? Because it was a symbol of His wrath, and Christ was going to be the one that endured this wrath. So you can get an idea of what this universal flood, this this catastrophic judgment, that gives you a, a figure of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It gives you an idea of the wrath that He endured for our sins, that He suffered the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God. And He said that the sign of Jonah um, was at, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Well, why in why, why did He go through the, the the whale's belly? Why did He have to go into that, into the deeps? You know, you see in in Jonah two, He says Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. It's never too late to pray, right? <laughs> If you're in the fish's belly, it's never too late to pray. And so uh, Jonah prayed unto the Lord and he said, I cried by, my, by reason of my affliction unto the Lord and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. And it says, and thou hast cast me into the deep and in the midst of the seas and the floods compassed me about and all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. And you see here, he's under this judgment and he's a figure of Christ. It's a symbol of Christ because Christ rose again from the dead. Jonah came forth out of the whale's belly. But you see the symbolism there where he's out of the belly of hell, he's crying. He said he's under the, the wrath of, of God. He's under the all of thy billows and thy waves have passed over me. And to further show you the, the symbolism, if you go back in chapter 1, if you remember the story, they were, um, you know, they, they, Jonah, the Lord said go to Nineveh, and the Lord said, or Jonah said, I'm going the other way. And he decided to disobey God, which is never a good idea. And Jonah jumped in the boat and he was going to go the exact opposite way. And of course, you know, the Lord is, uh, the voice of the Lord is up on the seas, right? So he's, he's in charge. He's in control. Uh, you know, the psalmist said, whither shall I go from thy presence? Whither shall I flee from thy spirit? If I send up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Uh, in Jonah's case, if I take a boat and go to Tarshish, thou art there. <laughs> I'm not going to get away from the Lord. 
And so you're, you're, you might as well not run from God, right? You might as well not try to hide your sins from God. You might as well not try to lie to cover them up because they're going to come out in the day of judgment. The Bible says some men's sins go open beforehand in the judgment and some they follow after. And the Lord's going to judge all sin. And if our faith is in Christ, all of our sin was already judged in Jesus Christ. Our sins were laid upon Him. But if you reject Christ, then all of your sins are upon your own head. And you're going to stand before a just God who does not change, who will not, who cannot change, and who is perfectly just and will bring into judgment all sins. And the severity of our sin, again, you can see in these, in these types and figures. But if you step back, they, Jonah was uh, fleeing and then this storm arose and they thought they were going to die. And Jonah basically tells them that, you know, this is really my fault, guys. I'm sorry. And, um, they decide to throw Jonah overboard. You know, they 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 feel really bad about it because now they're they're afraid of the God of the Hebrews because they see that he's the God of heaven and earth and he's bringing this judgment upon uh, um, Jonah, and they're they're participating in this because they're in the boat with him, and so they don't want to throw him overboard because they don't want to be guilty of killing the guy, and so they're praying for for God to have mercy. And it says in uh, verse 14, when they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done it as it hath pleased thee. And so Jonah, they took him, and, and this is what's interesting here, and you want to see Christ in this as well, in, in a figure, that they took Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly and made sacrifices to the Lord and made vows. And so what happened? When they threw Jonah into the raging wrath of God, then it stopped. And this is what happens on the cross. The wrath of God is like this raging sea, this flood that was coming in upon the world of the ungodly where God destroyed all flesh. He destroyed them all. And you see this wrath coming in. And what happens? God puts His only begotten Son into the wrath and then it appeases the wrath, is appeased. The sea is calm at that point. That's what Jesus did. Jesus took the wrath of God. He offered Himself. He cast Himself into the midst of the wrath of God and appeased the justice of God. And then He rose from the dead. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And then He came alive again. And so that's the figure that the Jonah uh, is. There's more going on there at, than at, at first sight. But we want to see that this is what the Lord has done. This is what the Lord does. And as a pattern, uh, we want to go back to um, the book of Exodus, back in the, the, the Red Sea, when the Red Sea was parted. You know, why does God use all these symbols? Why did He do all these things? Because of Christ. <laughs> It points to Jesus Christ. It points to what He did for us on the cross. It helps us to understand what happened on the cross. What did He do for us? And once you understand what Jesus has done for us, it should provoke worship and praise to know that, that God so loved us when it says that He gave His only begotten Son, that that's the, that's the picture. That He cast Him into the sea of His wrath and He appeased His wrath. His wrath was satisfied because Christ suffered the full penalty of the law. He drank the fullness of that cup, the dregs of the wrath of God, and he drank it without mixture, and he satisfied the wrath of God. In Exodus, we see the same thing. We know that the, um, you know, it says in the 1 Corinthians uh, 10 that the children of Israel, it says, uh, Paul says in chapter 10, verse 1, 1 Corinthians, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that our fathers were uh, under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So there's a baptism, right? There, there's the cloud you know, over top of them. There's the waters between it. And, and they were baptized unto Moses. And interestingly, Moses' name means drawn out of water because remember, he was drawn out of the water. And that's a figure of resurrection right there. To come out of the water is what... Jonah did, right? The sign of Jonah the prophet is also what the ark did, the ark of uh, Noah. And it's also what, what Moses was drawn out of the water. And so he becomes a symbol of resurrection in this, in this place too. But 
in, in Exodus 14, um, it says, and you remember the story, they're fleeing Egypt. They've had the blood of the Passover lamb, right? So the blood comes before the baptism, but, but, they, uh, but they are fleeing uh, uh, Pharaoh because he changed his mind again after God had punished him severely over and over and the nation. And so they're, the children of Israel, they let him go and then they finally decide they're going to come after him again. And so they, they get caught, if you remember, between the armies of, of Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen, and they get caught between him and, and the Red Sea. And they don't have anywhere to go, which is exactly where the Lord wants us, <laughs> where we have nowhere else to go. You know, Paul said, I was pressed out of measure above strength in so much that I despaired even of life, but I had the sentence of death in myself, that or we had the death, sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. So if you ever wonder why you're between a rock and a hard place, it's because God's getting ready to bring water out of that rock. <laughs> He's getting ready to supply your needs according to His riches and glory when you don't see any way possible that He's going to do it. Because the excellency of the power is of God and not of us. And so God wants us to recognize that He puts us in situations that we can't fulfill the task. It's, it's pressing us out of measure. It's above our strength. And we may even despair of life. You know, but God says, well, that's where I want you to be because that's a place of humility. That's a place of brokenness when you don't have any confidence in yourself. That's what the Lord wants. He wants you to not trust in yourselves but in He who raises the dead. And this is where He has Israel. He has them right there where He wants them. And they're thinking, what are we going to do? You know, What's going to happen? And so you remember the story in verse 21. It says, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made uh, the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. So here's where they were baptized unto Moses. There's a wall of water on both sides of them and a cloud over top of them. They're covered in water, but they go through to the other side. And so you see they pass through this wall on dry land and they go through and survive and that's resurrection. So God's showing the symbolism here is, is they're going through death, they're going through wrath, they're going through judgment, but they're coming out the other side. They're walking on dry land because Christ is the one that enables us to walk through the day of judgment on dry ground. You know, we're going to walk through on holy ground, of course, and that holy ground is Christ. But he says here that they walked through and the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea and all of uh, Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass in the morning, watch, the Lord looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of the fire and the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels and they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And then it said, The Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians and upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength. And the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered them covered the chariots, the horsemen, the hosts of the Pharaoh uh, and, uh, that came into the sea, there remained not so much as one of them. And so God's judgment was complete. Nothing escaped the judgments of God. When God brought the Egyptians into, into the sea and then He covered them with His wrath, that's, what it, that's what's going on here. The same thing that happened with Noah. God is bringing His wrath upon Pharaoh and upon his chariots, upon his horsemen, and he's destroying them. He's saving Israel from them. He's delivering them from the, the enemy, from the wicked one. And we, likewise, are delivered from the power of the devil because we pass through this wrath as well, but we pass through it in Christ because he endured it for us. He was put to death in the flesh. He was quickened by the Spirit. And so if we're in Christ, we have, and if our faith is in Christ, we have the judgments of God uh, have already been satisfied against us. Our sins have been paid for. 
by the blood of Christ, by His death, when He was baptized unto death and He endured the wrath of God, your sins and my sins were removed. They're gone. There's, you're not going to find them anymore. God has removed them as far as the east is from the west. And He said that this is with the covenant that He would have with them. That He said, I will take away their transgressions. I will put away their iniquities. And they would be remembered no more. And so that's, that's re- worth rejoicing over. You know, when you think about what your sins you've done and you think about the things that you sometimes maybe still feel guilty for, things that you've done, and still feel like, how could the Lord forgive me for what, it, well, because Jesus took your wrath. Jesus took the judgment. And if your faith is in Him, then you don't have any conscience of sins anymore. Not because we, we didn't, we're not guilty, but because Christ is our salvation. You know, Jesus means Jehovah is our salvation. That's what His name means. He said, Thou shalt call His name Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. And they went on to uh, rejoice in, in chapter 15 about how the Lord had overthrown them in the sea, in the depths that covered them. And, but if you go back, and this is what's interesting uh, in the chapter, when God first brings them into this situation where they're facing the sea and they're facing the Egyptians and they start to murmur, um, as we're prone to do when we get in situations that we don't have any control of, you know, uh, we start to complain. And, uh, and so they're here murmuring against the Lord and against Moses. And uh, let's see, uh, Pharaoh's drawing nigh. And, and they said to the Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, that's why you brought us out here. <laughs> There's not enough places for him to bury us in Egypt, so you brought us out here to kill us. Is that why you brought us out here? And so they're thinking that uh, the Lord is not going to have mercy on them. And Moses, in verse 12, uh, I'm sorry, verse 12, it says, um, Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it is better for us to serve the Egyptians that we should die in the wilderness. And look what Moses said. He said, Moses said unto the people, stand, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen, whom you have seen today, ye will see them again no more forever. For the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. So Moses tells them, stand still and see what? That Jehovah saves. See Jesus. Jesus means Jehovah saves. And so Moses in figure is saying, hey, you're, you're facing this wrath. You're facing the enemy. There's nothing you can do about it, but just don't worry about it. Just stand still and watch Jesus. Watch what Jesus can do. And what did He do? He, he took care of the situation. He destroyed the wicked. He saved them from their own sins. And the Lord fought for us on the cross. That's what happened. The Lord fought for us and became our salvation. So thanks be unto God for His wonderful mercies and and you see this, you see this figure. I don't want time to go through all of them, but you know when Moses cast the uh, branch into the waters and Merah and and turned the bitter waters sweet. Well, that's what no, that's what happened with Jonah, right? He threw in the branch, who's Christ, the branch, and he turned the bitter waters sweet. And you see this figure all through the the scriptures. And um, go to the Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon, chapter eight, and. This, uh, obviously, if you've read it, um, it's a love story. And, and I believe Solomon found the love of his life, which is a figure of, again, the bride of Christ. Because why did God make marriage? Obviously, he made marriage as a symbol, as a figure of uh, him of salvation, him joining himself to a bride. And so this is what the figure of marriage is, which is why our culture wants to destroy what marriage is and wants to wreck it and, and pollute it to, to so thoroughly that you don't even know what it's about. You don't even know what it symbolizes anymore. You know, and, and it, it symbolizes that the strongest love you'll have is, is when you fall in love with, with your wife and that's what produces the children. God is bringing salvation because He's seeking a bride. God wants a bride because God is love. Like why, why are we here? Why is, what's all this about? Well, it's because God is love. That's why you're here. It's to the praise of the glory of His grace. That's why you exist. It's because God wants fellowship. He wants to love you. And in the process of all this, it's like hard to wrap your mind around. Why does God want to love me as far as, you know, as sinful as I've been and as, as sorry as I am as a, you know, as a human? Why does God want to love me? Because God is love. But the barrier between 
God's love uh, uh, being upon us is our sin. And so God had to do something about our sin. And God took the care of our sin so that He could have this relationship with us. And in the Song of Solomon at the end there, um, it, what looks like is going on is Solomon is married. The Shulamite is coming to her mother's house. He's with great pomp and glory because he's the king of Israel. And she's married to the king. And it's like, wow, you know, <laughs> he's going to show off. She's, she's, he come to my parents and let my hometown see what happened to me, you know. <laughs> And uh, we're going to be to the praise of the glory of His grace, you know, the church. And the Bible says unto Him is going to be glory through the church throughout all ages, world without end. The Lord, we're, we're the trophy bride of Christ. The Lord, What the Lord gains in us is that, that people can say, wow, the Lord, He took those people and He redeemed them and now He's glorified them. And they're going to say the, the wonderful works of God. How in the world can God take someone... Vile as Brother Kenny used to be. <laughs> the Lord knows. I don't know how vile you were, but the Lord knoweth. But take someone like that and regenerate them and, and transform them and turn them into a saint, from a sinner into a saint, and make them his bride. And he'll show them off for eternity, forever. Because the angels weren't redeemed, right? The angels weren't, they didn't, they weren't reconciled back to God. They didn't, weren't pulled out of sin, out of darkness, out from under the judgments of God and restored to a place that they had. This is only contained in the redeemed believers. This, this glory of His grace is only contained in us. And God wants to glorify His grace, and that's what marriage is all about. That's why the Lord, that, that's why He created it. And here we see this figure, and I want you to see the, the wording He uses because He's almost speaking in a parable. And He says in verse 6 and 7, in chapter 8, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. And if a man would give all his substance of his house for love, it would be utterly contemned. And be held in contempt. The, 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 the glory, uh, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy with the glory that shall be revealed in us. But Paul, uh, I'm sorry, Paul here, Solomon was saying, um, set me as a seal upon thine arm, for love is as strong as death. And that's Christ, right? The love of God is, uh, was stronger than the justice of God. Not that God is divided, God is unified. But in order for God to bring us into His love, He has to satisfy His justice. He has to satisfy His perfect uh, holiness. It has to be satisfied. And love was able to do it. The love of God, which is shed abroad in Christ Jesus. And who shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? You say, shall persecution or tribulation or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And he said, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. And Paul said that I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right? So, praise the Lord. If you're not in Christ, you better get there fast. Because <laughs> you don't want to miss out on what God has prepared for us in the world to come, in the glory to come. And so love is as strong as death. And But here, jealousy is... Cruel is the grave, and the coals are coals of fire that hath a most vehement flame. Hell is God's jealousy, the fire of God's jealousy. God said, I'm a jealous God. You know, and God has revealed Himself through the creation of the world. God has spoken to all civilizations day unto day, utter speech. Night unto night is showing knowledge. You can look up at the sky and say, Wow, look, there's the ordinance of God following His their courses just like He commanded. Just like He created them. They don't deviate. They don't go off their paths, their courses. I mean, they, they can predict them with computer models. That's how precise they are. They don't change because they're God. They're the servants of their God. And God is speaking through the heavens and the earth. He's speaking through the glory of the heavens day unto day. Every day, He's telling 
Every person on earth, it said there's no language nor voice where their, uh, or language or tongue where their voice is not heard. Everybody on the face of the earth knows that that God exists and that He is controlling them and He is the source of their life. That in Him they live and move and have their being. They live in God. They dwell in Him. That He is their Creator. He's speaking that continually, day unto day, night unto night, and people are walking around saying, well, God needs to show some evidence. You know, God needs to be more clear. You know, we, we don't see. It's God's fault that, you know, I'm an honest man. I'm trying to seek the truth. I'm trying to find the truth. I want to know if God exists, but He just hasn't shown Himself. That's the way the sinner talks. And God says, you're the liar, not me. God says that the heavens declare my glory, not the glory of some pantheistic energy, not the glory of some uh, uh, idol. It's the glory of the only true and living God, the creator of heaven and earth. It shows his glory. And so that the Bible says that they have no excuse. They're without excuse because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. You know, if you, if you start realizing that, you know, you can be thankful for a lot. <laughs> If we start going through what we can be thankful for, but the Bible says that the ungodly are unthankful. They're not thankful. They murmur about problems. Uh, uh, and I, I started uh, trying this tactic on uh, some of them when they come up and they start complaining about, well, if God's real, why is there cancer in the world? I'm like, well, what are you doing about cancer? What have you done? You know, this is the biggest problem on earth, and what are you doing about it? Because they're not doing anything, generally speaking. They're just murmuring and complaining about why God hasn't done what they think He should do and while, so that they can live in pleasure and walk after their own lusts and say, well, you know, God ought to be the one that fixes it. You know, well, maybe God's saying, well, why don't you do something about it? You know, why don't you do some research? Why don't you donate some money? Why don't you, you know, you could do something. But instead, the sinner wants to live in sin. They want to walk in the pleasures, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and make themselves the enemies of God and then blame God for the problems in the world and hold God responsible and say it's God's fault and I'm trying to find Him, but he just won't, He's just too obscure. You know, so who's, who's telling the truth here? The Bible says that they have no excuse, that they are without excuse. And it says, that which may be known of God is manifest in them, not just to them from the creation of the world. The invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Clearly seen. That's what the Bible says. They say, well, I just can't find God. It's like, well, you're not going to see God. He's higher than the heavens. you know. So you're not going to see Him and He fills heaven and earth. But to act like God is not clearly visible, and I'm not talking about a, a, a visible image of God. You know, there, there are, there's the invisible attributes of God. The invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Even His eternal power and Godhead. The fact that He exists is demonstrated from the creation of the world. His power is clearly seen. And so that there's no excuse. And so the sinner is in this situation where God is revealing Himself. God is jealous. He doesn't want His glory to be given to another and yet they want to take the glory of the incorruptible God and make it into an image like the corruptible man. They want to make God like them. You know, if you talk to sinners, God's okay with homosexuality. God's okay. Well, God doesn't care how I use my body. You know, it's my body, my choice. And God says, no, it's not your body and it's not your choice. You know, I designed your body. I gave you your body. I put your soul in your body. And when you die, I'm going to call your soul out of your body. And you're going to be judged in the resurrection when your body is brought forth out of the, out of the grave and, and your soul enters into your body, you're going to appear before God to give account of the things done in the body according to what you've done, whether it be good or bad. It's not your body. It's not your choice. You didn't make it. You didn't design it. You don't keep it alive other than, you know, if you eat. Uh, but God is the one that designed it to, to, you know, metabolize food and all that. I mean, it's God's design. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And so for... For people to take the glory of God, the wisdom of God that's all around, and to say, well, God's just not clear. You know, God's at fault. He's not revealed Himself. God's anger is, is kindled against them. God's wrath is kindled against us when we take the glory that He clearly displays, that no one has any excuse, and they turn that and say, well, God's okay with my sin, or... If there's a God, He doesn't care how I live my life. Or you know, if, if there's a God that exists, they make an image, an idol, 
a fake God that does not exist and it's, an, and it's a product of their own imagination. And they worship that instead of the real God, instead of the true God. Well, what happens if you teach them about a false God that will damn their souls? And we think the day of judgment is going to be a light thing. It's not going to be a light thing. It's going to be a horrible thing for the wicked. And it's going to be a terrible thing. And so we need to have a, a, a concern for our neighbor. We need to realize that, that this, is, this is an awful thing that they're facing. That the, the coals of God's jealousy are a most vehement flame. It will not be quenched. It will not, it will not end. It's, it's a fire that never shall be quenched. And that's what they're facing unless we tell them about Christ, unless we try to intervene for them, unless we try to pray for them, unless we try to be there to provide them with some, some guidance and to lead them to Christ. That's what they're facing. And so Christ so loved the world that He, that he, that he the Bible says that He offered Himself without spot to God, that He intervened, He, he interjected Himself. And, and so here, love is as strong as death and it says that uh, jealousy is cruel as the grave. But it said, many waters cannot quench love. And in that, I want you to see that the waters of His wrath could not quench the love of God. And so Christ rose again. The Bible said that it was not possible that He should be holden of death. It was not possible for death to hold Him. Because He was, he was righteous. He was the Holy One of God. He did no sin. He was sinless. And so when He died, death had no power over Him. And so He rose again. The waters could not quench Love, neither could the floods drown it. And he, he finishes here that if, if you were to give your whole, the substance of your house for love, that, that would be nothing. It would be held in contempt. You know, and so what does it profit you if you gain all that you want out of this, all the pleasure of this life, all the job opportunities, all the investments, all the, you know, everything that you want to get out of this life, and you miss the love of God. And you miss that love that's waiting for you forever. That eternal life that God is is provided for you through Jesus Christ, and so I want to, um, but I want you to think about what Christ has done for you. I want you to realize what Jesus has done because He loves you, because He wants you, He wants a relationship with you, and that when you begin to fellowship and commune with the Lord and spend time with the Lord, that you your the things of this earth, like we sing, the things of this world grow strangely dim. They become insignificant. You don't really care that much for them anymore. Because you realize that your life is passing away; it's a vapor. You know all the things that you, all the treasures you accumulated when you die. Your family will probably be fighting over them. That's what's going to happen to them. They're going to be wasted. They're going to be burned up one day. They're going to be dissolved in, the, in fire when the heaven and earth pass away. And what matters is: Were you found in Him? Were you found in Christ? Are you a lover of God? Because God says that the, that the fulfillment of the whole law, like what God wants out of the law. Is for you to love him and to love your neighbors yourself. That's what God. That's that's the love that God has uh, revealed to us. That's why He wants you to obey the law. Because and, and if we love God, we will obey the law. We will obey because that's what gets us closer to God. You don't have to be told to love your children or to love your wife. You'll just do it because you do. You'll, the works will follow. And I'll leave you one last verse here. Um, in, in Hebrews chapter 8, God says, um, finding fault, he's talking about the old covenant that passed away, finding fault with them, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. We just read about that. God took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. And And the reason that God led them out is because He wanted to be a father unto them and He wanted them to be His children and He wanted that relationship with them. And, and uh, I'll finish the text here, but I did want to... I was reminded of that uh, verse in Hosea when, when the Lord said... He was reminding Israel when they were young when He said that when He brought them out of Egypt, He said, I will um, speak comfortably unto her and then, then he said that, that she would, um, let me find the verse here. He said, she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. When the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, he says she sang there. Remember, we read the song you know, in, in, uh, in Exodus 15. 
you know, but they were singing unto the Lord, and God said that that He brought her forth, and she's going to sing again as in the days of her youth. She's going to rejoice because that's what God wanted. God wanted that relationship, and He still wants that relationship. And He says that the days come that He would make a new covenant, not according to the way He brought them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in My covenant, and I regarded them not. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put My laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to Me a people, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know Me from the least to the greatest." And I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Why does God want to forgive our sins? Because He wants to love us. He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to be our Father. He wants you to be His son and His daughter. Forever. That's what God wants. And so God has wrought so great a salvation through Jesus Christ. He's done all these... He's done this thing that you can't even conceptualize. He had to give us figures and shadows to show, to give an understanding of what He did to to redeem us. And why did He do it? It's because He loves us. And He wants a relationship with us. So I want to encourage you this morning to to worship the Lord and draw closer to the Lord. We're coming into days of darker deception and, and, and wickedness. And the only way you're going to see your way through this is if you stay close to the one you love, which is Jesus Christ. So let's stay close to Him and nurture that relationship and that, that, that fellowship that we have with the Lord. God's called us unto the fellowship of the Son. This is eternal life that they might know Thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom Thou hast sent.